All right. Greetings, peace, and power be to all the beautiful people out there. This your girl, Tiffany, coming through right here live in the fit. So I want you guys to do me a favor, hit the notification bell, share the video, and subscribe to the channel. And also, yeah, make sure you just uh, tune in. All right. So greetings, greetings, greetings. All right. Peace to those in the chat. I see y'all. Peace, y'all. All right, then. So today I'm going to be dealing with a topic about Lewis Adams. Lewis Adams was a former slave. OK, but he also helped founded Tuskegee Institute, which is now Tuskegee University, which was also founded by Booger T. Washington. And check this. George Washington Carver played a role in it as well. But we many don't know about Lewis Adams and who he was and how he got involved in the entrepreneurship and helped founded the school. So we're going to look at his life. We're going to look at his legacy and we'll look at all the things that he has contributed. All right. So now let's go ahead and get started. All right, as you can see here, this right here, this is the picture of Lewis Adams. Okay, this is Lewis Adams. So who was Lewis Adams? Now, there's not a lot of information on him, but it's just only brief. So I did what I could as far as uh, finding, looking up the stuff and whatnot. But this is what we have so far. Lewis Adams was an African-American former slave. Now, he was born on October the 27th, 1842, and died on April 30th, 1905. All right, he was, a, he was an African-American former slave in Macon County, Alabama, who is best remembered for his work in help, helping found the school in 1881 in Tuskegee, Alabama, which grew to become the normal school that with its first principal, Booker T. Washington, grew to become Tuskegee University. Little is known of Adams' early life. It is known, however, that despite having no formal education, Adams, Adams could read, write, and speak several languages. Check this out. Adam could read, write, and speak several languages. He was an experienced tinsmith, hardness maker, and shoemaker. He was married to Sally Sarah Adams, with whom he had 16 children with. He was an acknowledged leader of the county's African-American community. Adams was especially concerned that without an education, the, recent, the recently free former slaves and future generations would not be able to fully support themselves. There were no institution at the time to teach them exceptional skills. In partnership with a white former slave owner, Adams established a school in 1874. In 1880, Adams was approached on behalf of two white candidates seeking election to Alabama Senate. He was asked what if he was asked what it would take to get the votes of the community's black citizens. Rather than requesting and or accepting personal gifts, a common practice he made a deal with the Democratic Party in Montgomery promising to secure the African-American vote if funding would be provided for a normal school for African-Americans at Tuskegee. He and a banker, George W. Campbell, another former slave owner, skillfully convinced the Alabama legislator to begin funding of $2,000 annually for a Negro normal school in Tuskegee, starting in 1881. Normal schools were so named because they taught future teachers educational standards or norms. All right. So, as we can see here, Mr. Lewis Adam made a deal with the Democratic Party saying, look, all right, I will contribute, but you will have to help us out to raise money up for this school, which is now Tuskegee University. And so far, they had raised up $2,000. Now, $2,000 at that time was a lot of money, okay? 
It was a lot of money. So $2,000 today is not so much of a money compared to how it was in his time period. All right. So peace, 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 brother. Thank you for coming in. All right. So yeah, 2000 wasn't a lot, but it helped jumpstart the school. Now you're going to hear about Tuskegee Institute again when I uh, bring the topic back up. So, but yeah, um, this is something that Booker T. Washington wanted, right? He wanted, he believed that blacks should do for themselves. He was very radical. And that's why he inspired Marcus Garvey. Because Marcus Garvey wanted to meet this man. He wanted to sit down and have a, a conversation with him. But by the time he got here to America, Booker T. had passed away. So it was too late. But that's what Garvey got his inspiration from. From as far as do for self and take care of your own community and whatnot from Booker T. Washington. Because Booker T. said, you know what? We got to do this. We got to build our own community. He was a former slave. George Washington Carver was a former slave. Louis Adams. Now, all these men come from the background of slavery. They pitched in together and they put their focus on building an educational facility for their own people. It's amazing. But let me go ahead and continue. All right. So it says Lewis Adams then recruited and hired another former slave, Booker T. Washington, upon recommendation of General Samuel C. Armstrong, the founder and principal of the Normal Schools for Black Blacks in Hamilton, Virginia, to become the first principal from a humble beginning in a small school in a local church out building on July 4th, 1881. The school moved in 1882 to 100 acres of plantation farmland purchasing with a two- hundred dollars personal loan from the treasurer of Washington's former school, which eventually grew to become Hampton University. So Booker T. Washington started off working at Hampton University, which was the uh, normal school for African Americans. That's where he started. Then from there, he was inspired based on his work at the HBCU to start his own version. I right, greetings, greetings, greetings to everybody in the chat. Let's continue. All right, so also it states that Louis Adams later served as a translator of Italian, French, and German for Booker T. Washington. Now, he was a serial linguist. This man knew Italian, French, and German. Anyways, continue. For Booker T. Washington, when he traveled to Europe, Louis Adams' daughter, Virginia Adams, was the first graduate of Tuskegee Normal School to receive a diploma from Booker T. Washington, who led Tuskegee and later, to some extent, led the nation in race relations. Like Louis Adams, Dr. Washington embraced the concept that former slaves needed practical job skills to support themselves and their families. Lewis Adams and Booker T. Washington had an uncle slash nephew relationship with Adams guiding Washington throughout the Tuskegee community. Adams and his family helped Washington galvanize support among the African Americans in the Tuskegee community to support the growing school. Together, Adams and Washington built the school into a self-contained, self-reliant community. Adams, Lewis Adams died in 1905. All right. In addition to building the school in Tuskegee, Washington became a famous orator, means a, a speaker, and secured major funding from wealthy American philanthropists such as Andrew Carnegie, Colas P. Huntington, 
John D. Rockefeller, Henry Huddleston Rogers, despised his travels and wild widespread work. Dr. Washington remained principal of Tuskegee until his death in 1915 at the age of 59. At the time of his death, Tuskegee Endowment exceeded $1.5 million in the U.S. dollars. At the time of his death, Tuskegee Endowment exceeded $1.5 million. So they raised up a lot of money after he died. And another famous African-American who taught at the school of Lewis Adams' dream was Dr. George Washington Carver. So down here, here's the reference. Okay, so it's not that much of information. Um, there we go. All right, so with that being said, um, that's a little bit of something. Now, I found a few more sources that kind of relates to this topic, but it talks more about Tuskegee. So I'm going to go ahead and show that for you guys. Okay. So this one is called Tuskegee and the Politics of Illusion in the New South. Y'all see it? All right, there we go. All right, so. All right. The name of the journal is called The Black Scholar, Journal of Black Studies and Research. All right, Tuskegee and the Politics of Illusion in the New South. It was written in 1977 by Manny Morebo. All right, so I'm going to read this first part right here, and then I'm going to skip. It says, there are two statues in Macon County, Alabama. The first is an old Confederate war monuments situated on the town square in central Tuskegee, surrounded by the major commercial di district of the county. The second, a distant or perhaps two miles from the center of town, is located on the campus of Tuskegee Institute. In the shadow of the new college chapel, beneath several impressive spreading ferns stands the statue of Booker T. Washington, the famous black educator lifting the veil of ignorance from the face of a black slave. It is of this famous yet ambiguous statue that Ralph Ellison wrote, uh, what is this word, Penangony, that it, it, that it was impossible to tell whether the veil was being lifted or being lowered. Mm. Both statues represent two historical opposing social forces which have dominated the culture, terrain, and general civil societal formation of central and south Alabama, and southern alabama for four dec four generations the defeated white races who reconquered the governments of state and local communities after the compromise of 1877 and the aspiring black in intelligentsia whose political horizon were first sketched by the wizard of tuskegee booker t washington both sculptured symbol represent a profound interdependency. The Negro academic strata Washington created and inspired could not exist without key, key compromises in politics to the white establishment. Yet the white dominated economic base would collapse without the continued economic support of the black perpet bourgeoisie. Both statues represent two central elements of the bitter drama, which is Southern history and politics. Neither could have existed in the 20th century without the other. Therein lies the central burden of Southern politics. All right. The possible outline for transcending the tragedy of Tuskegee political past was offered in Charles V. Hamilton and 
Stokely Carmichael's bestseller, Black Power. Devoted an entire chapter to Tuskegee, Alabama, the authors claim correctly that the city and county were undoubtedly one of the most significant areas in history of the black man in this country. Ten years ago, blacks within the county had refused to use their newly won electoral majority to create the politics of black power. Preferring instead to employ the politics of deference and biracial government to achieve their limit goals. However, Hamilton and Carmichael's interpretation do not adequately explain what happened after 1967. With the election of a majority black county and city government, a prominent aggressive black mayor and the retreat of many whites from the vicinity, serious political and economic contradictions still threaten the existence of Macon County. To understand why black politics fell within this black belt Southern County, it is essential that the entire historical tradition and class structure of black and white Tuskegee be critically reexamined. By unearthing the past, we can more clearly discern the historical terrain upon which future black belt political struggles will be fought. <laughs> Woo. One day, you know what? Now let's look up what the black belt is, okay? So you guys hearing that term, so I'm going to go ahead and pull up what the black belt is. All right. So real quick, let me pull up the term black belt. All right, so here it goes right here. All right, so what is the black belt? All right, the black belt in the American South refers to the social history, especially concerning slavery and black workers of the ge geological region known as the black belt. OK, the geology emphasizes the highly fertile black soil. Historically, the black belt economy was based on cotton plantation, along with some tobacco plantation areas along. Yeah, yeah. Along what I say, yeah, along with some tobacco plantation areas along the Virginia, North Carolina border, the valuable land was largely controlled by white, rich whites and worked by very poor primary black laborers who in Maine counties constitute a majority of the population. Generally, the term is applied to a larger region that than that defined by its geology. All right. After 1945, a large fraction of the laborers were replaced by machinery and they joined the great migration to cities of the Midwest and the West. Political analysts and historians continue to use the term black belt to designate some 200 counties in the South from Virginia to Texas that have a history of majority African-American population and con production. All right. So let's go down here to the geographic geological formation. So the black belt is a physical ge geography term referring to a roughly crescent shape geological formation of dark fertile soil in the southern United States it is about 300 miles 480 kilometer long and about and up to 25 miles 40 kilometer wide and I I think in calculation I think that's what the CA stand for east west orientation mostly in central Alabama and northeast Mississippi during the Cretaceous period about 145 to 66 million years ago, most of what are now the central plains in the southern eastern United States were covered by shadow sea. Tiny marine uh, plankton grew in those seas and their carbonated skeletons accumulated into massive chalk formation. That chalk eventually became a fertile soil, highly suitable for growing crops. The Black Belt Arc was the shoreline of one of those seas where a large amount of chalk had collected in the shadow waters. All right. So as we know, the Black Belt is dealing with the uh, dark fertile soil, right? But from a political standpoint, oops, 
Uh oh. My bad. Yeah, from a political standpoint, right? Is really dealing with those uh, blacks that were uh, enslaved in these states. And they were working out there on the field, particularly those that did tobacco and that did a lot of cotton, things like that. So, for example, for example, um, Georgia, Georgia is considered as a black belt state. Why? Because there's a lot of cotton out here. You, know, you see what I'm saying? It's a lot of cotton and it's a lot of tobacco, but more so cotton. So a lot of people... And especially if you go further south in Georgia, a, a lot of people have done a lot of um, field work and they basically picked a lot of cotton and whatnot. Uh, excuse me. I don't know who you are. Uh, Snuggle668. Six, six, um, I am a fast talker. I can't help the way I talk. So... Uh, if you if you just new to my chat, I appreciate that. But I, I can't talk very slow. You know what I'm saying? I'm not a very slow talker. Sorry. You know what I'm saying? I don't I don't talk very slow. But I appreciate that. But welcome to the chat room. Welcome to my ch channel. Welcome to the page. Okay. Thank you very much. But um uh, yeah, that commentary that you made, I don't think that was necessary. I don't think you didn't have to go there. All you had to say was, you know, sister, take your time. I understand if you say take your time, but talking about talking slow and all that, nah, all that ain't necessary. And if you ain't noticed, I'm from the South. I have a Southern accent, so that's another thing. You're going to learn that we have what's called condensed pronunciation. If you don't know what condensed pronunciation is, you might want to look it up. So condensed pronunciation is relaxed pronunciation. So everybody that's in the South, okay, they have an accent, but everybody don't always fully pronounce everything correctly. You know what I'm saying? So hopefully that makes sense to you. Yeah, everybody don't pronounce everything correctly. So most of us have what's called condensed pronunciation. Um, which is relaxed pronunciation, which is that we don't pronounce all our words all the time. Okay. So, but again, thank you for tuning in. An interesting character. All right. Um, getting back to what I was saying before. All right. So, yeah, that's the black belt. And if you want to look up more information about this, again, you can go over here on Wiki One. Um, yeah, you can look up Wiki One and you can find out more information, read it up. But I just wanted to get to that point real fast and quick. All right. All right, then. So let's look at, let's go back to the previous information. Let's see. Okay, which. All right, so. All right, let's go to another information right here. Okay, yeah, this is the same one. So I'm going to skip down um, where it talks about it was not black power which aided in the, in the creation of Tuskegee Institute in 1881 as Carmichael and Hamilton claimed, but rather an accommodation of selfish interests on both sides of the color line. During the election of 1880, Colonel Wilbur F. Forrester, a crusty Confederate war veteran, was a Democratic candidate for the Alabama legislator representing Macon County. 
Forrest and his close white political associate, Arthur L. Brooks, also a candidate for the state legislator, needed substantial votes from the black community to carry their districts. Both white politicians went to Lewis Adams, a former slave who had learned the art of time smithing and shoemaking to see if he could use his influence in favor of their candidate candidacies. According to local legend, Adams and other black politicians, I mean, excuse me, black Republicans agreed to support the Bourbon Democratic ticket on the promise that the politician would secure passage of a bill establishing a black normal college near Tuskegee. All right. It says in the important election of 1880 democrats finally achieved total control over the over the black belt receiving almost twice as many black votes for governor as they have received in 1874 foster and brooks won by handsome margins thanks to black tuskegee support in gratitude by early 1881 the house by a margin of 48 to 20 and the senate by 21 to 7 approved the creation of a black institution which became tuskegee institute check this out what lewis adams and other black republicans and independents who voted for brooks Foster and the entire Democratic ticket could not observe, however, were the white's selfish private interests in establishing a black college. Arthur Brooks was then publisher of the Tuskegee Making Mail, a former county superintendent of schools. Brooks used his position as newspaper publisher as the county's most influential lawyer to get white businessmen to see the advantages of a local black school. Some black families had fled to the county in the late 70s when white racism was especially harsh. All right, so now let's start right there and let's look at the present moment, okay? Okay. So, as you can see, to start this school up, right, going back to Lewis Adams, what he did was meet with candidates, right, on both sides. So, by him being self-proclaimed Republican, because you had a lot of black people that did participate, participate in the Republican Party. That's what they did. A lot of them became Republican, Okay. So, again, he sat down with the white Democrats and told them, hey, if you help, then I can help get more black people involved in voting. But you got to be willing to help donate money to the school. Now, today, black folks who are ignorant, who don't have the knowledge about politics, will consider him to be a coon. They was trying to say he was a coon because he was a Republican. And then you got some black Republicans, they'll try to look down and say, oh, he's a coon because he's dealing with the Democrats. But if you understand how the cards have to be played in order to get what you want and get the resources that is needed for your environment, for your community, yes, you're going to have to go to those who are your opposition. You may not like your opposition, okay? You may not like, you may have a problem with your enemy, but at the, however, if that's all you have available, you have to use those enemies just so you can get what you need from them, all right? So you have to play nice with them, okay? You have to play the game of chess. So life is not checkers. Life is chess out here. So it's so many black people that's willing to say that, oh, because this person is interacting with this group of people, not knowing the whole entire thing, not knowing what's going on or the premises behind it. The first thing they will call the individual is a coon. As you can see with that situation with Ice Cube, they called him a coon, right? Why? Because he said with both party and he sat down with Trump. And these are ignorant people who don't understand. 
they think because somebody interact with Trump or the Republican Party that they're trying to jump on board and be buddies to buddies and friends with them. No, that's not how it goes. That's not what it is. It's not about being friends. It's about getting the resources. And if I can get this person, yeah, this person might be my opposition. Yeah, there might be my enemy. Yeah, they might be somebody I don't get along with. But if they the only candidate that's willing to work with me and do and give me what I need, then why not go for that? So, but anyways, um, okay, hold on. Let me, let me, okay, I'm going to say this again, Snuggles, okay? Yes, I tend to do that. Yes. I'm going to tell you again, I have a Southern accent. I appreciate you, but it seems like you're coming off wrong. So I'm going to correct you again. I have a Southern accent. Do you not hear my accent? All right. And for you, you may not understand. You may not articulate. So I'm assuming you're new here. Okay. Okay, so if you understand what I'm saying, I get that. I can't help that I have a Southern accent. I can't help that. What part of that do you not understand? I can't help my accent. That's just what it is. So there is going to be words that is going to be mispronounced. No, I'm not going to block this person. No, I'm not going to block them. Mm -mm, I'm not going to block them. Because I'm going to let this comment sit right here. Because this person has the right to say what they need to say, and I'm going to say what I got to say. So I don't have to block them. But I appreciate you saying that. I'm not going to block that person. Nah. Anyways, getting back to the point that I'm making. Um. Yes. So, yeah, there's going to be some things that I'm going to mispronounce, all right? Or words that I'm going to mispronounce. And that's okay. It happens. Um, there's some words that I'm not familiar with that I'm going to mispronounce. Um, as I was saying before, again, I can't do nothing about my accent. I have an accent. And it's happened to be a Southern accent. So I happen, I've been this way all my life. Ain't nothing I can do. I can only try to be clear and I can try to make it where you can understand me. But if you can't understand me, then... There's nothing I can do about that. I'm sorry. You know what I'm saying? So, I mean, I can only do it. Okay, so, and this person put, I understand what you were saying about needing the enemy's help, but where does the black community get their mindset from when it comes to being diplomatic? Okay, so. Now, your last question, I'm trying to figure out what do you mean where they get their mindset from when it comes to being diplomatic? A lot of us haven't learned how to be diplomatic, for one. That's the thing. So, a lot of black people haven't got to that level of being diplomatic. Hell, a lot of black people haven't even got to the level of being revolutionary. So that's the first thing first. So let's just be honest about that. Okay. So um, we don't even have a very strong representation in our community, to be honest with you. If we, if we did, if we did, then the question about diplomatic wouldn't even come up. But at this point, when you ain't got no strong representation and you're only going to take what is given to you, you're only going to use the resources that you have available, then that's just what it is. Yes, because the ignorant mind of individuals, right, regard to Ice Cube, they're not seeing what he was trying to do. They're trying to insinuate that he was jumping on the bandwagon with Trump. And that was not the case. 
And even after he tried to explain it several times to people and trying to get people to understand, he even said to himself, he's not a politician. All right. He's now, um, he doesn't represent any political parties. Okay. He, for one, he's an entertainer. Let's, let's look at that. He's an entertainer. He's a rapper. He's an actor. Okay. He come from the streets of Compton, California. He doesn't know anything. He doesn't know anything about politics. So he's learning what he can about the political arena. So what he did, which was smart, was to talk to both parties. Okay? That's what he did. And try to see who can come up with the better agenda, who will, who is willing to work with him on his contract about black America. So he was trying to see who had the best agenda and who was willing to sit down and talk with him and work with him. So, okay, Lester, I don't know that. I mean, if that person is, I wouldn't know. So, I can't verify that to be true. I don't know that person. If that person happens to be what you say they are, a troll, then I would deal with them. Then I would block them. But until then, I don't know for sure. You know what I'm saying? I don't see that person's image. So I don't know if that, I don't know what the ethnic background that individual is that making the comment, Lester. So, so all right, but thank you for letting me know that. But for right now, I'm going to let that slide. I'm going to let it slide for, for now. Okay. Because usually I don't deal with trolls on my channel. I don't deal with trolls. But I'm going to let this comment slide because I don't really know and I don't have the full knowledge about this individual. Right? So that person hasn't really said too much offensive. If that person get out of character and they get out of line, then that's when I handle the situation. Until then, this person ain't really got out of line or out of pocket with me all the way. So... I'm not going to do anything at this moment. Now, if it gets disrespectful as fuck, then yes, I'm going to take care of that. All right. So anyways, um, thank you guys for those of you who are watching. And um, I apologize for the fact that I had to make some comments. You know, just know that I am paying attention to your comments. Okay. So I may not get to all your comments, but just know I'm paying attention and I'm reading what you're putting up there. So, <laughs> so don't be slick now. But anyways, um, check it. I'm about to go ahead and log off of here. And I thank you guys for watching. Um, if you want to share this video, you're more than welcome to do so. And also make sure you hit the notification bell when I come on. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. Make sure you um share the channel. Do what you got to do. And with that being said, that's all the information I have about Lewis Adams. And that's it. All right. Now, um, I hope you all have a wonderful and productive day. And please, 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 please be safe out here. Okay. We still deal with this COVID. We still dealing with this pandemic. It ain't going nowhere anytime soon. All right. So please be safe. Please be careful. Please be mindful. All right. All right, then. Um, I will see you guys hopefully tomorrow. Okay. Around this time. And I will um post information like always and make sure. You you guys read the information for yourselves and share it with other people. You see what I'm saying? So that's important. All right. So until then, y'all have a good one. All right, then. All right. Let me answer this one last question. 
No, it's not a setup. The pandemic is. Let me respond to this. For those of you that believe that the pandemic is fake, it's a hoist, it's make believe or whatever, it's not. Just because you can't see it with the naked eye does not mean that it don't exist. Virus has been around for a long time, okay? Virus been around since humanity been here, okay? So, of course, you can't see a virus. You can't see a parasite. You have to look under some type of electric microscope or something in order to see it. But it's here. And there are people that's dying from this, all right? Yes, there are people that's dying from the COVID-19. So the COVID-19 is real. The pandemic is real. All right? That's why we got to be careful. This is not a joke. It is no game. It's no filter. It is what it is. It's not an exaggeration. It's real. All right? But anyways, you guys have a wonderful day, and I'll talk to you all later. All right? Thank you.